Everybody say favor forever. Favor forever. Come on, now say favor forever. That's what Jesus Christ gave you at the cross. Jesus Christ at the cross gave you permanent, total favor with God. He said, you know what? I will die to take your place so that you could have favor forever. But here's the thing. We don't just want favor with God. Wouldn't it be nice to have some favor with some other people? Wouldn't it be nice to have favor, I don't know, with the person that you said I do to? Come on, yes or no? Yes, yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk to you about how you get favor forever with the one that I remember. I was, I was 20. 19. 19. <laughs> and she was 17. And I got down on my, I know, could you believe it? I was seven, she was 17, and I got down on my knee, and I opened up, well, 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 you, we were by waterfalls, really pretty, we, we you, and, and she said yes and everything, it was awesome. I said yes both times, you asked. Oh, that's right, I forgot I asked twice. <laughs> See, the first time I didn't have a ring, so the second time I had to get a ring, so it was like all official and stuff like that, but seriously, when I said, Will you marry me? And she said, yes. What I was hoping for was that we would live happily ever after, right? You want to see favor with the one that you marry. If you get married, you want to grow old together. Who wants to grow old with their spouse? Even if you're not married yet, would you like to get married and grow old with your spouse? Come put your hand up. If your hand's not up, there's something wrong with you. Especially if you're married and they're sitting beside you. What you want to do is you want to grow old with the one that you married. I just went and visited my grandfather. No kissing this... in the back row there. What's I going saw on back that. There? Oh, Banana just kissed. They're making out in the back? They're making out in the back row. Oh, geez. <laughs> They're married. <laughs> anyway, so this last week I went to see my grandparents. Who she, He is 93. He turns 94 next week. She is 92. Yeah. And they, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing to watch two people grow old together and the way they speak towards each other at that age. And he still gets to drive at 93. I know, isn't it crazy that 93 year old's driving, but he's, he's driving a little bit and like, he just loves her. And it's beautiful to see that. I want to grow old with her like that. I want, I, I want to spend my life with her. Somebody, before the service started, I, the first service started, I was talking with a pastor friend from another church and we were, I was driving here and he called me. He's like, I don't want to keep on the phone because I'm going to preach a few minutes. And I'm like, dude, this is like an easy talk. And he's like, what do you mean it's an easy talk? I, like, I said, we're talking about marriage and I like being married. So when I'm having this conversation about how you find favor with the one you marry, I actually like her. I like to be with her. I like to be around. We work together all day, every day. I never get so sick of her. you better like me. Like, th this is the person that I want to spend my life with. This is what marriage is about, that you want to find favor forever. Say, favor forever. We want to talk to you about how you find favor forever with the one you marry. Can we do that, church? Cool. On the back of your chair, there's a note sheet. I'd love for you to take some notes, write some stuff down. Real quick, I want to do a shout out to Big Lake, to Zimmerman, to television, and to online. Can we say hello to all those guys? Hi, mom. So for all of you hanging out with us, thank you so much. We're going to have a great, great conversation. I'm just going to give you five thoughts on how you walk in favor forever with the one you married. Let's pray and we'll do it. Jesus, thank you very much for every heart and every life. I pray that as we have a conversation about marriage, that even those that are not married yet will be thinking about as I walk into marriage, what do I want to prepare for? What do I want to plan for? What am I thinking about? What do I need to have my mindset be? What kind of foundation do I need to build so I can walk in favor with my spouse eventually. I pray for every marriage that's struggling right now that you would bring hope and healing to it. I pray for every single person, every, every, every person who struggled with divorce and been there and done that. God, I pray that you would bring healing to their heart today as they walk into their future. God, you have a good destiny for every life, whether they are married or single, young or old. We know you're gonna do great things. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. So I want you to say the word think. Do you know thinking is what determines whether you have a great marriage? Do you know that this mind that God gave you is your greatest sexual organ? Your sexual organ starts in the mind, not someplace else. What you think about, you bring about. So what you think about in relationship to the one you marry determines whether you have a good marriage. What do you mean? Favor follows what you believe about your spouse. Right. So if you think, gosh, I can't believe I got to go home, married to the old ball and chain, what kind of marriage are you going to have? Oh, 
That's the, you're going to have a great marriage, right? <laughs> Seriously, you can't think negatively about the one God gave you and walk into something awesome. But people do this all the time. You hear, you hear dudes talking about their spouse. I can't believe I got stuck with her. She's always griping me out. They're like They're thinking negative about the one they married. And they start thinking, this is what happens. If you start thinking negative about this one, what do you start thinking about others? Positive. She gets me. She understands me. I really like to be around her. She's, it's so much better to be at work than it is at home because she understands me. Can I just tell you, if your thought process is that she's not awesome, you will never have an awesome marriage. But if you switch that around and said, no, 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 this is the greatest gift I will ever have on earth besides Jesus, you're going to have a good marriage. That's right. Because your thinking leads to your outcomes when it comes to marriage. Come on, say think. What you, what you think about, you bring about. What you think about, you bring about. What you think about, you bring about. It's not just enough to say, I do. You got to think towards your mate, towards your spouse, towards the one you're married, positive. This is what scripture says. This is Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. All the passages of scripture, we have five passages, five, five, five passages we're gonna look up this weekend. All of them come from the book of Proverbs. The reason why is the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's the one, it's the fortune cookie book of the Bible. You open it up, oh, except it's actually good wisdom instead of like, that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> it's actually some good thoughts on how you walk in wisdom. And the first, the first verse I would give you this weekend is Proverbs 18, verse 22. It says this, he who finds a, what's the next word? A wife. Finds what is bad. Finds what is what? Good. Finds what is good and receives, what's the next word? Favor. She is the tangible evidence that God loves me. That's what the verse says. If you are married, it is the favor of the Lord on your life. But you don't know who I got stuck with. You don't know what. See, but God did. God knew your first day from your last day. He knew how you're wired up. He knew who you, knows who you know to, need to be with. And so he decided that in your best interest, you needed to be with this person. And if you believe it is the right person, it's the right person. But if your thought is, I made a mistake. I made a, I know I made a mistake. I just, I, I, I gotta get, I, I made a mistake. I, I, I just made, as soon as you say that, where's your marriage going? You can hear the flushing sound <laughs> as it falls apart. Isn't this true? Cause you're thinking about your spouse determines the success or failure of the marriage you're in. And so you must first start with the thought is, this person that I am with is the greatest gift I have ever received besides Jesus. If that is your thought, you will treat that person that way. You'll be all excited to serve her and help her and do sweet nothing like little whispers in her ear and take her out me nervous and open you. up the door and... Like you're gonna like all of that happens because your thinking is correct. You know we have an enemy of our marriage. You know, just like God wants us to have a successful marriage, the enemy of our hearts also is the enemy of our marriage, and He wants to ruin our lives by ruining our marriages. So, it's true. you know, I mean, all of us have had thoughts, negative thoughts in our minds about our spouse. If you have never had a negative thought in your mind about your spouse, I want to meet you after church. But. Um, <laughs> But what, when the enemy whispers in that lot, you know, he didn't pick up his underwear again. He doesn't care about me. He never cares about me. He takes me for granted. I'm just as married. And you just, you know how your thoughts just go. Anybody ever experienced that? All, no. the women, all the women in the room and just a few of the men. But when we catch that thought, as soon as it pops in and we say, and I will say it out loud because sometimes you just get so angry. You're just, you know, all these thoughts and you're like, and you're agreeing with yourself. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll just say, no, that's a lie. Just say it out loud and tell the whole world that's a lie and then speak truth. I have favor in my life. And that's, when you sh that's how you shout that down because sometimes it's really hard. I mean, not with you, of course. <laughs> Your thinking determines the marriage you get. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. Think of it like the foundation of a home. You want a great home? 
Your thinking, your thinking is your foundation. It is, the, it is the rock solid thing that everything else is built on. And if your thoughts are, she is the favor of God, he is the favor of God on my life, what you're going to have is something good. Yeah. It's always going to go someplace good. Okay, second thing on walking into favor with your spouse is agree. Because favor follows unified faith. Everybody say, favor follows faith. Favor follows faith. Favor follows faith. Faith. Now this, we're talking about how we can see God's favor on our marriage, and then he helps to put the favor in with your spouse. There's a verse in Proverbs, again, chapter 333, it says, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. I'm going to say that again. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked. And you're like, what? My house isn't wicked. And then it says, but he blesses the home of the righteous. And you're like, but my home's not always all that righteous either. So we all think we fall somewhere in the middle. But I'm just going to explain really quick, I think, what this verse means. Uh, pop quiz. Who was the first couple in human history? Wow, you smart people. You guys are smart. It. I know, right? So Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, they disobeyed God and he said, you have brought on yourself the curse of sin. And then he kind of listed a few ways that this curse was going to play out in their lives. One of those ways was on their relationship. You know, there's the whole childbearing thing. It's going to hurt and the work in the ground, it's going to be hard. But he also said, there's going to be conflict in your marriage. And the reason is it says, Eve, he said, Eve, you're going to want to control your husband. And then he says, but Adam's going to control you. So right there, the very first couple in human history, they were told that the curse over marriage is a power struggle. So and you guys are going to fight simply because you said I do. Yeah. Happy thoughts by God. So hold your hand up. Hold your hand up. Okay. Now go like this. Whew. You're not the only one. We Every were born with couple. it. Because that's part of the curse of sin. A power struggle in marriage, conflict in marriage, is just part of the curse of sin. So does that make our home wicked? Yeah, it is. Because we are all, it says all of us are desperately wicked. But God sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for that wickedness. And when we walk into that, we know that we walk into the favor of God. And we walk into the righteousness of God of God. So scripture says that when we are in Christ, we are the righteousness of God. That's why we say totally righteous. Everybody say totally righteous. That's totally what you are righteous. if you believe. And so that's where the favor comes in. The Lord's favor is on the home of the righteous. So husband and wife, if you are both walking in the righteousness of God, that gift that he gives us, then you know that you're going to see the favor of God on your marriage. But it's important that we are both walking in the favor of God and in the righteousness of God. And that's why it is so important for husband and wife to be on the same page spiritually. Because scripture says, it, how can two people walk together unless they're, unless they're in agreement? I mean, imagine Eric and I are walking forward and, come here, stand by me. And it's raining and there's an umbrella and we're walking together. And then one of us decides we're going to walk somewhere else. That leaves somebody else out in the rain. We need to be walking together under the same umbrella on the same path in life. And that's where we see God's favor on our life. So that's why it's really important to come to church and worship together. And if one of you doesn't like this church, go to a different church. We want you to know your marriage is way more important than you being at the Crossing Church. It's true. Absolutely, 100%. Find a place where you both can worship together and you both feel like it's home for you and worship God together. Eric and I start each day um, reading scripture and praying. And we, we don't read together. We don't like, oh, it's your turn to read. It's your turn to read. It's, it's not for us, particularly because I don't talk first thing in the morning. But, um, you know, we start each day and, and, you know, as he does it and I do it, it's like I'm not nagging him to read his Bible and pray and he's not nagging me. It's just, it's our habit together that we each start our day walking on the same path, praying. And, you know, we'll pray together. We pray at night before bed. Um, we have a lot of hard time sleeping a lot. So we pray a lot before bed at night just to pray for good rest and all of that. What a lot of us think is she can have her belief system and I can have my belief system, right? The problem with that is this, that your belief system affects everything. everything. Yeah. It affects how you spend your money. It affects where you go on the weekend. 
It affects how you treat people. It affects, uh, what? It does? How does it, how does it affect my money? Really? When we talk about tithing in church, and like in the, if somebody who doesn't believe is like, I don't want to do that. And somebody says, I want to do that. Now what do you have? Conflict. And you've got two people who go, oh, one goes, I want to go to church. I don't want to go to church. Well, fine, you do that. I don't want to do that. Now you've got two different groups of friends. And there's this constant, like, I don't want to nag you, but like, I really would love for you to join me. I don't really want to join you. You've got to make a decision together. You've got to walk in unity about what you believe so that you can stay connected as a couple. Do you know one of the top five reasons for divorce in America is now a different belief system? It's because we get to the point where we're like, it doesn't really matter what you believe, but your believing affects everything about your life. So if somebody doesn't believe like you about God, about faith, about church, about, like, that doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means you guys better work that thing out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because so you if you your can't come to agreement, success. you're going to constantly be in conflict. Mm-hmm. Constantly. Okay, well, let's, you guys ready to go to the third one? Yeah. Everybody say, speak it. Yeah. After you have thought it, and you have agreed to it, you got to speak it. Favor follows the way you talk. Tell me how it is possible to have an amazing home life and marriage and call her things you ought not call her. Tell me how you have a beautiful, successful, healthy home and have constant nagging going on. Does this help? But we fall into these patterns all the time. I can't believe you're so. I can't believe you never. What's wrong with? As soon as we go down this path, you are destroying your marriage rather than building it up. There's a verse uh, that is not in the notes, so you can't put it up on the screen yet. But there's this verse in the, in the book of Psalms that says, I have set a guard on my mouth not to sin. I think you need to set a guard on your mouth not, a, not to sin against your spouse also. Mm-hmm. That just like you don't want to sin against God so you can walk in good relationship with God, you also want to set a a guard on your mouth so you can walk in good relationship with her. How can you have a successful marriage and talk negative to her? How can you have a sex... How can you have a sex... (laughs) No, no, right there. Freudian slip. Okay. Freudian slip. Who knows? Probably not going to get that either if you're talking negative. (laughs) Just like a preacher. I'm just saying. I'm not sure that's romance on the way. (laughs) Where I'm, where I'm going with that is this, though. So many people believe they can say that kind of stuff and it doesn't damage anything. Right. It damages everything. Yeah. The words you speak create the environment you live in. That's right. The words you speak... Okay, let me ask you a question. How did God create the world? He spoke it. He spoke it into existence. The environment you live in was spoken into existence. The environment you live in in your home was spoken into existence also. You speak the environment you have. That make a sense? Yeah. This is Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. It says this, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. When you're speaking positive and encouragement, and faith over your spouse. I mean, I'm going to actually say this way. The opposite of healing to the bones in terms of speaking would be the silent treatment. I'm just going to give him the silent treatment. <laughs> now he's going to be healthy. Really? How's that help? So you've got to decide that communication doesn't include the silent treatment. Now, sometimes it's wise to just shut your mouth. Yeah, but I'm not saying for like three days. I mean, I know from personal experience. Like, this is what I, I actually had a conversation with a pastor one time who he hadn't talked to his spouse in three days and he couldn't figure out why his relationship was messed up. Another pastor. Seriously, you can't have no communication and have something, or, or I'll give you another, another pleasant words. Pleasant words include, I'm sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> Aren't those lovely words to say? <sighs> it's, that's part of pleasant words. Being willing to admit, man, I'm, I'm the, like, I'll give you a secondary verse. Proverbs 24 to 26 says this, an honest answer is like a what? A kiss. It's like a what? Kiss on the lips. It's like a kiss on the lips. An honest answer is like a kiss. If you want to get a little more kissing done, maybe you need to be a little more honest. 
A lot of times we say stuff like, oh, I can't tell her that because she couldn't handle it. I would tell you she can handle it just fine. That's why God had her marry you. That's right. That is the lie again. She couldn't handle it if I told her the truth. No, no, no. She's stronger than you think she is. Mm -hmm. She loves you more than you think she does. So you have to come to the to agreement that you're not going to keep secrets from each other ever. You want to get a lot more kissing done? A lot less <laughs> secrets going on. How you spend your money. How you spend your time. Where, what you're doing over there. How's this working on? Like, seriously, like being willing to be open and honest and divulge. See, this is supposed to be your best friend. Not some other girl, not some other guy. Like, I'm like, my girlfriend and I, we just sit and talk, and it's great. And Girls say that all the time. But your best friend's supposed to be here. This is the place where every secret can be spoken about, had a conversation about, and, and gentleness, respect, grace, and love can be brought to the table so that you can be honest with each other so that you can continue to maintain this friendship. As soon as you start to create secrets, you're destroying your friendship. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Give me a third verse. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. A wise woman builds her what? Her house. She builds her house. A foolish one. Come on, talk to me. Tears hers down. So foolish people live in a house and tear down their spouse. Wise people are thinking, I want to build up my house. This is, like, this is the house I live in. I want to offer encouragement to her. I want to offer love to her. I want to tell her she can succeed, that God's going to do more with her, that, God, that faith is going to happen, like, like joy, there's a future for her. You're speaking life over her, over him. And also to other people. It's so important that we never speak negatively about our spouse to other people. Better yet, speak positively about your spouse to somebody else when you know your spouse can hear you. My husband is amazing. I like this. You know what my husband did? He gave me a back massage with no strings attached. Yeah. <laughs> my husband's awesome. You know what? My husband's successful in his job. I'm so proud of him, and he pro provides well for our family. My husband is a great dad. He's a great, you know. I'm a better dad when she tells me I'm a great dad <laughs> than if she tells me I need to go spend some more time with the kids. And don't you think you're just not doing that right? Like, which is going to make me a better dad? I'm so proud of you because you're such a good dad. As soon as she says that, I'm going to go hang out with the kids. Yeah, I am. I'm going to go hang out with the kids. Because you, <laughs> elevate, you elevate somebody with the words you speak. And if they're elevated, they'll succeed. Is this making sense? Yeah. See, what you speak determines, determines the environment of your home. Yeah. Negativity, going to produce negative results. Positive in the home, going to produce positive results. Every time. Every time. Fourth way to walk into favor with your spouse is act. Everybody say act. Act. You got to do something. Favor follows servanthood. And I'm going to call this an MWE. M-W-E, a marriage work ethic. We need to have a strong marriage work ethic in order to walk into favor with our spouse. See, so many of us are willing to work really hard at school or really hard at our job and our career, or we'll work really hard at fitness, not me, and we'll work really hard at She's our She's actually working hard hobbies. at fitness too. She's doing great. Oh, see, he's saying that because he thinks that means I'll run with him tomorrow. It, it will. <laughs> she will too. She'll be like, I got, we got to run. No. <laughs> you can't use the stage for this. <laughs> Marriage work ethic. So what I was going to say was something nice about you. <laughs> something that I've always really respected, though, about my husband is how hard he works at the things that are important to him. Fortunately, about 20 years ago, he decided that I was going to be important to him. And so he works really hard at our marriage and our relationship. And it's really cool because when we go to counseling and we have an awesome marriage counselor and everybody should have one, that's all I have to say about that. But when we go there, he, say, he looks at Eric and he says, according to your temperament, you're not very affectionate and you don't speak very, you know, you need to work on there. And we just laughed because he is so good at speaking, I love you. He'll say it so many times that I'll be like, okay, just if you change your mind, let me know. Otherwise I know, <laughs> you know? But he works really hard at our relationship. He's very good at it. And uh, recently, 
how this played out was um, Pastor John Hill got his wife a ring. And I was like, that is really cool. So I was like, John Hill, why don't you tell Pastor Eric that his wife wants a ring? And I said, now he's going to look back at you and say, no, she doesn't, because I don't care a lot about, you know, rings or expensive jewelry, just junk, you know, like this. And I was like, but when he looks back at you and says, no, she doesn't, just look back and go, yeah, she does. Okay. And so I was like, "Uh I just put in a good word. Maybe I'll get surprised by a ring, you know, like in the next month or two or six or something. (laughs) The very next day, I was at home and Eric had gone to pick up Braden from school and he comes home. He's like, come here, come here. He sits me down, he gets on his knees in front of me, and he's like, I got you something. And I'm like, really? You couldn't have even waited, like, you know, a while to surprise me. So I busted up laughing right away, because I knew, you know? So he pulls it out. He's like, I got you this. And I'm like, oh! You know, I'm laughing because, I mean, it's just funny how fast he does things. And so he's showing me, and I'm laughing. I'm like, oh! And he goes, yeah, it's your birthstone. I don't even know if you like it, but... And in that moment, I had a decision to make. Because we've been married a long time, and I know about the honest answer is like a kiss on the lips, and I know how secure he is. And so I was like... He's like, I don't know if you even like it. And I was like, I hate it. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like... <laughs> so we just, you know, we're just laughing. I'm like, I really hate my birthstone, but it was so sweet of you to buy me a ring. Oh my gosh. And so we were laughing, and he reaches in his pocket and pulls out a matching necklace and earrings. <laughs> so I'm crying. There are tears streaming. It was the funniest moment. But I'm trying. <laughs> he's trying, man. And you know what? Sometimes our husbands don't always get it right. Sometimes we don't get it right. But there was so much value in that that I knew he just wanted to do whatever it was that I wanted. He just wanted to bless me. And, and um, you know, that's the thing about, about uh, in marriage and being willing to, to serve each other and to, to work at our marriages is recognizing what it is that our spouse likes and needs. And the best way to go about that is just ask. Ask them. What can I do for you that will help you know that I love you? And for me, honestly, I mean, I do like gifts, but um, if he washes the dishes, I like, you are the hottest man on the planet. You know, being a good dad, like taking the kids out and leaving me home alone, oh my gosh. When you get home, you know? I mean, like what works, you know, what works for you, you gotta communicate about that. But um, on the other hand, Proverbs 18, 9, it just says, you know, one who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. If you are lazy about your marriage, then you are just on the path to destroying it because it was really easy to fall in love at first. And people say marriage takes work, but they think it only takes work when it's really on the rocks and suddenly you decide to start working at it. But we've got to put work into our marriage to make it not just survive, but thrive. And when you, if you really want to see favor with your spouse, work at it today before it gets nasty. Nasty, and it never will get nasty. I would say even a little, like I would up the ante a little bit and say, I believe that you need to work harder at your marriage than you do at your career. It's so much more important, isn't it? Yeah. Man, which is more important, your career or your marriage? marriage. Your marriage. So why wouldn't your mindset be, I'm going to work harder at this marriage than I do at my job? Man, what you're going to end up with is something beautiful. Your boss might not like you. Hey, who cares? She thinks you're hot. Isn't that what you really want? Man, I know that like the, if you get married and you're going to walk into that relationship, at the end of the day, you want it to be good. The way in which you see it succeed is that you continually sacrifice for the one you married. I know that two things makes her excited. One, I clean things. She's happy with me. Two, I give her a back massage. She's happy with me. Three, I'll give you a third one. Three, I buy her olives. She's happy with me. That's like, I I give flowers or olives. If I go with olives, it's a much better day. That, that's, that, 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 that does something for her. And you know what though? He doesn't care about gifts much. Like for me, what he cares about is my words. So my words can build him up or tear him down in a heartbeat. And so in my, on my prayer list, what I pray about every day is help me to love Eric well, even when it requires sacrifice. And a lot of times what I sacrifice for my husband is not my time, it's not my efforts, it is the right to be right. 
I sacrifice the right to be right. She's the logical one. I know this is like, for some of you, this is a surprise to you. She's the logical one, and I'm the illogical one in our marriage. I'm, I, I am, woo, and I'm having fun, and I'm going to be over here one day, and I'm over there the next day. It's and intuitive. She's the one. You're intuitive. It, I'm weird. <laughs> She's logical. So when I come to her and say, I think we ought to do this. And she, I, I can see it in her head, all the reasons why that's stupid. <laughs> but if she doesn't say it and she goes, okay, <laughs> I know I am well loved. Because sometimes what I just need to do is for her not to give me the five reasons why it's not a good idea. I just need her to go and do it with me because I thought it was fun or I thought it was cool. And maybe it isn't the best possible use of our time, money. Uh, like maybe it's not the, like seriously, the, the money one is what people get into all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe that's not the best use of the money. Every once in a while, it's okay. I will tell you this though. Every single time that I have submitted to his decision on a financial choice, despite my fear or my lack of agreement, God has blessed us. God will always bless you for allowing your husband to lead women. God favor follows you. faith. Yeah. Favor follows faith. So being willing, this is all about sacrifice, man. And it's even simple things like we should go out to dinner tonight and I'm calculating how much it costs our family to go out to dinner. Five people, really huge people now that eat a lot. And I'm thinking that's not a good idea. And I'll just look at them and go, okay, if that's what you want. And what somebody will pick up our tab at the restaurant or somebody will hand us money or we'll get a check in. The- I am not kidding you. It seems like a stupid thing, but it is God saying, Kelly, I just want you to let your husband lead and be right and make good choices and don't argue with him sometimes. And that's really hard for a high dominant person. And, and that, that doesn't mean I'm right all the time. He's usually right <laughs> when I let him be. <laughs> that's pretty, <It's> okay. <laughs> Because the truth is, is she's more logical. So if I let her make the choices, we're going to have the logical outcome and things are going to go very well. But you, and this is probably true for every one of you married couples. One of you is more logical and one of you is more intuitive. That's the way God wired you up. And both of those are necessary for a marriage to succeed. There's not one. I can't believe you're not logical. Really? God didn't make everybody logical. Nobody, not every, the whole world can't be Mr. Spock. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> On the other hand, I can't be the one always to make the choices just because I feel like it. I need to be able to submit my thought just because I'm in this emotional whim. I need to let it go and to let her go, this is, I, I think we need to consider this and I, I got to take the step back and step out of the way and let her lead. This is mutual submission. This is mutual sacrifice. This is mutual success in the conversation of marriage. And when we function like that, we really, really do well together. We also lead the church better together when we're functioning healthily. We do. Do Both of us are high dominance. You think? Like we're both, we're we're both firstborns. So we both feel like we're right all the time. (laughs) So having, like the first time we ever went to marriage counseling, we were like, okay, we're sitting down with marriage counselors. He he looked at our our temperament profiles, like how we're wired up. And he looked, this Recipe for disaster. Those were his first words. <laughs> first thing he ever said to us. And we have an awesome marriage. But it's simply because as you walk in faith, step by step, and you think right, this is the favor of God. Secondarily, you agree to do this side by side. You're going to think the same about faith. Third, you're going to speak favor over each other. Then you move to action and your actions tend to work out because your thinking was worked out and your agreement was worked out and your speaking was worked out. Are you hearing me? Even if you're both highly dominant and think you're right, which leads to the last one. You ready for number five? Date. Everybody go bounce, chicka, wow, wow. (laughs) Favor follows romance. See, the, 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 the truth is, is that guys in here, we're really good at romance before we're married and we, we're terrible at this after we're married because we really wanted to get her. <laughs> so we're opening doors and we're buying flowers and we're telling her how pretty she is and how great she is. And after we got her, what do I got to open the door for? Why do I got to take her on a date? Because dating is cheaper than divorce lawyers and marriage counseling. <laughs> 
This is what, this happens all the time. People come to us and they're like, yeah, we're, we're, our marriage is really on the edge. We don't think we're gonna stay together any longer. I'm like, when's the last time you went on a date? Uh, what you invest in is the results you get. Yeah. We don't have any money, man. We're, we're broke. You didn't have any money before you married her either. <laughs> you were going to McDonald's and buying, buying a shake and sharing it because you had a dollar. <laughs> but you were happy, right? See, part of being married is you consistently date your spouse. Every week, you're thinking, like, literally, I'm talking, like, every week, yeah, like, every week, like, what, like, what if once a week, you're thinking, where can I take her? Where are we going to go? I'm going to set up a, a ways, or, like, we used to have to get babysitters. Now, now our kids don't need babysitters any longer. But when we, like, we're gonna, I'm going to set the babysitter up. I'm going to take care of the whole deal. We're going to go to this place. That's a big deal, guys, setting up the babysitter, because otherwise, she's just like, it's too much trouble. I'm not even going to mess with it. If you set up the babysitter, it's like, whoa. I mean, that's, that's. Yeah. The surprise factor is important. You get in the car and like, hey, where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? Where you going to go? That's not a date. I have a plan. Now it's a conversation on how we're going to waste time. <laughs> no, no, you want to date your spouse. You want to set something up. You want to take her to the movies because you, you planned it out in advance. You're taking her to this nice restaurant first. And this is, you knew she wanted to see the chick flick, even though it was, you thought you were like, ah, you're like, okay, I'll go. <laughs> You didn't have to go, like, you know, you see, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But if you just think ahead a little bit, you don't have to spend $100 every week. You can spend $10 a week. And she's thrilled because you took the time and you made the effort. And then you spent a little bit of time together and you hung out and you had a conversation and you didn't talk about work and bills and the kids. On the date, you're actually blessing each other and you're encouraging each other and you're talking about maybe what, what are we going to do next with our lives and what's our future going to look like? One of the things I loved about taking vacations with Kelly um, is when we go on vacation on the drive, we're always talking about what we're going to do next. The conversation always moves to where are we going to go next? What are we going to do next? What are we going to accomplish next? We start, we start dreaming again whenever we're on those. Like Dates are great times to dream because you're doing it together and you're facing the future together and you get excited about being, oh my gosh, this is going to be fun. Because the goal of your life is to get to old age side by side, hand in hand, smiling at each other. Other people going, how did they get that 60 years in? They're still smiling at each other. They're so cute. Did you see her kiss her? Her kiss her. <laughs> you know what I meant. <laughs> it was going really well. until Right, right up till that spot. <laughs> then we just lost it. <laughs> Proverbs chapter five, verse 18 and 19 says this, and I like this passage a lot. It just says, enjoy the wife you married as a young man. Enjoy her, lovely as an angel, beautiful as a rose. Don't ever quit taking delight in her body. Never take her love for granted. See, this is a recipe for something beautiful for a very long time. But here's what I want you to understand. You can't walk into the romance unless the thinking started first. It starts with, she's the favor of God. It moves to agreement on our faith our future. It continues as you speak grace. By the way, um, does God speak negative over you? Never. No, he's approving of you. He died for your past so he could approve of you. So we speak positive, like God speaks positive over us, which leads to our actions and sacrifice, like God sacrificed himself for us. And this all leads to a recipe of romance. Where, if these five pieces are a part of your marriage, do you really think it's going to be awful? Yes or no? no? No, I don't think it could be awful if the first one was right. If you're thinking about your spouse changed, your entire marriage would change. Your speaking would be different. Your romance would be different. Your actions would be different. Your agreements would be, like, everything changes when your thinking changes. She is the favor of God. Everybody say, she's the favor of God. Say, he's the favor of God. The favor of God. When that thought process is in your mind and in your heart, the only thing that is going to happen is something beautiful. You can have the favor of God and the favor of each other. God set it up in the book of Proverbs. 
I hope you live it out. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much. I just pray right now for every couple once again in this room that you would grow their marriage, you give encouragement, you give hope, you give healing. I pray for every single person, whether whether they've never been married or whether they've been married before and they're single now. God, I pray that you'd bring healing, wholeness, and help to their heart too. I pray that as they walk into their future and their destiny, you would lead them to a relationship with this is their mindset, this is their plan, this is their foundation. And God, I ask you to do something good in all of our lives simply because you love us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, amen. Mm -hmm.